Turkey Mountain is almost in the heart of the city, there's probably within a six, seven mile radius, I want to say there's in the neighborhood of probably 200,000 people that could bicycle or walk to Turkey Mountain that have that, you know, connectivity. And Turkey Mountain's it, it connected to our River Parks Trail system. There are several bike lanes, you know, bike routes that come through the city that you can hop on and you can literally like ride to Turkey Mountain from your house. You can ride 30 plus miles of soft surface trail or run a marathon without hitting the same tw trail twice uh, at our urban wilderness. And so that is just an incredible resource to be able to have for people. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Ryan Howell with the River Parks Authority up in the Tulsa area. And we're gonna be talking about this amazing activity asset, really network of activity assets of parks and trails and recreational opportunities, but also the fact that this network of trails and pathways provides a key connectivity to many neighborhoods, including the downtown area of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Ryan. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's a pleasure having you here. Oh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Ryan, why don't you just take a, a moment to uh, introduce yourself? So my name is Ryan Howell. I work for the River Parks Authority, which is one of the park systems in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been with the park now uh, around six years, and I was in that really fortunate place where I was just volunteering for the park a lot for like trail cleanups and maintenance days and some of the many events they had. And I literally volunteered for the park so much they offered me a job. So <laughs> I'm a pretty fortunate fella. I love that story. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, what, what's sort of your background? Do you have uh, uh, any uh, formal training in parks or anything like that? So I no, I spent um, uh, 10 years as an archaeologist for the Bureau of Land Management. And so I have a very uh, fancy degree in archaeology that I use very little nowadays. Um, but I initially, um, you know, I was with the Bureau of Land Management. And so through working with them and all the very processes that, you know, the various processes we went through there, very similar to park management, just on a significant scale so you know you talk about access you talk about recreation you talk about um you know park users and users and things like that so i was very much in that realm although i was doing archaeology i was in that world and um i just got to learn a lot about trail design and maintenance through that process and you know just volunteering for the park so much uh you know, literally they had an opening and they were like, we think you'd be a great fit. So come and do it. And um, so, no, not any experience at all. Wow. That's great. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I mean, and and really, I would imagine, you know, that background in archaeology. Uh, occasionally, you, you probably come across things that are out there in the parks. Like, hey, oh, OK. I can, you know, it's. Oh, absolutely. Pretty, yeah. 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 We have I mean, thousands of thousands of acres of park and um, we. I was just having an email conversation with the state archaeologist yesterday about some things that were found in the park that uh, not necessarily archaeological resources, but somebody felt they were. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there, there you go. There you go. Uh, what I'll do is uh, I'm going to press uh, just a, a play on a video that you all have out on your YouTube channel. And while this is just kind of playing, why don't you introduce uh, not only the parks, but the park itself and its in its relationship to the city, because I think there's some very, very specific things that we'll eventually talk about uh, in that context. But en enough of these two guys on screen here. Let's 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 get some pretty pictures rolling. So uh, so why don't you introduce us, uh, you know, to the parks? You bet. So Tulsa, Oklahoma is in the northeast corner of Tulsa in the Ozark foothills. And the Arkansas River, which is an intermittent prairie stream, runs basically through the western portion of Tulsa. Um, in the 1970s, the county of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, realized that the river was very prone to flooding and that they knew residential development and business development 
would want to start moving into the river corridor. And this was a horrible idea because if you look at some, a lot of other cities that develop along the river corridor, they have massive problems when it comes to flooding, millions and billions of dollars worth of destruction. So in the 1970s, Tulsa, Oklahoma had the very forward thinking idea to not develop the corridor along the river space and instead turn it into a park. And that's how the river parks system was born. And uh, we're very grateful to it for it this day. All through the pretty much every most of the acres of land along the river through the middle of the downtown area all the way down through the suburbs is undeveloped land and it's green space. And so as time has progressed, we have expanded our trail system. It is a dual paved trail system um, that has a side for uh, hiking, walking, running, pushing a stroller, and then it has a side for wheels. Um, so it has your bicycles, your scooters, rollerbladers, the whole shebang. So, um, and we do divide it kind of uh, differently. Um, you know, in various places, it kind of ebbs and flows, as you can see on the screen there. It's, it's very well divided. But we also have numerous parks that dot along the river corridor. So a little playground, bathrooms, amenities. We have um, a restaurant area with a, a beautiful restaurant that overlooks the space. There are numerous crossings because the, the um, trail system actually is on both sides of the river. The east bank has around 12 miles of uh, paved trail on it. And the the west bank of the river has around um, five miles of the divided paved trail system on it. Fantastic. And we can see in this image here uh, the downtown Tulsa area in the distance. And yeah, I, I really appreciate your comment, too, that they had the foresight to not develop it. And they also had the foresight to not build a highway along it, which is what so many cities in North America ended up doing. Yeah, we do have a um, one of our major thoroughfares. You can kind of see it to the very right of the screen called Riverside Drive, shockingly, um, that does pass in some cl places closer to it. But for the most part, um, it is just an open area and it is prone to flooding. You know, we had a major flood in 2019 where the area that you're looking at right now was partially underwater. Um, but, you know, when the waters receded, hey, you know, we had maybe two, three million dollars worth of damage. But imagine if that were businesses, homes, et cetera, you would have been talking about infinite amount of damage. Oh, yeah. I mean, 10x, 20x, who knows? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's insane. Um, and I think that's it, it really is interesting how important those decisions are. I mean, this is the you're living the legacy of decisions that were made, you know, 50 years ago. Um, and, and in some cases, you know, in many places, you know, in, including in other places in, in, in Tulsa, I'm sure you're living with the legacy of some not good decisions made 50 years ago and 60 years ago, et cetera, um, and navigating through that. Um, talk a little bit about that relationship between the built environment, the communities uh, and, and downtown uh, Tulsa to the River Park Authority and the River Park system. And I'll actually see if we can pull up the map and, yeah, uh, and, and get a visual on this. But yeah. here we go. There you go. Yeah, zoom out on that right there. And then we'll and zoom you can out see. here. And I think yeah. there we go. Now we got the downtown uh, Tulsa, you know, kind of in focus there in the top of the screen. Walk us through that relationship uh, you know, of, of the entire system, like you said, it does kind of pass through the downtown area um, and then stretches uh, further down to the south. Yeah. So on your screen, you can see downtown Tulsa is to the very kind of top of the screen, the north end. And so the river trail, the river parks trails pass, you know, directly. I mean, they abut the downtown area. So when you uh, ride or walk, um, it is, you know, three or four blocks. If you're staying in a downtown hotel, you got three or four blocks till you hit the river corridor. And once you hit the river corridor, we don't have any stop signs. We have fully protected um, spaces for walkers and bikers for miles and miles and miles. So you don't have to worry about those intersections with vehicles and other types of traffic. Um, the 
trail system actually extends not only through Tulsa, but well into our suburbs. So if you follow the river corridor up and around to the west from downtown Tulsa, you can kind of see a light green line on the screen. That is what's called the KT Trail, the kt and It's an old rails to trail um, tra um, trail that's been converted. It goes all the way out to Sand Springs and just a little bit further. So there's another 10 miles of trail over there. Now that one does have a few crossings on it, um, but they're mostly in residential neighborhoods. Um, and then if you go follow the trail south uh, along past our Turkey Mountain Urban Wilderness, past Helmrick Park, um, and keep going south past the River Spirit Casino, the trail cuts and goes along, uh, it goes along a, a, a toll road, um, but it goes all the way out to Broken Arrow, which is a huge suburb in the southeast portion of Tulsa. Yeah, you can kind of see just how far it goes. So from one end of this trail system to the other, we're talking about 30 plus miles of connectivity, of protected space for pedestrians um, to be able to use. And we have a ton of people that commute to work on a regular basis downtown through our park space. Um, and, you know, and use it for their long rides, for their long runs, marathon trainings. I mean, two weekends ago, we had Ironman running on our paved trails. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's one of the, the, the really important things to, to remember, too, is that um, recreational trails, if we only view them as recreational trails. I mean, if our trail networks and river, uh, you know, uh, uh, pathway systems and greenways, if we only view them as um, recreational in nature, then sometimes we end up making decisions that that kind of prevent them from having utilitarian purposes. Mm -hmm. But if we yeah. provide ample connectivity to the surrounding neighborhoods um, and, and they're built well, they're built with ample enough space, um, they can be multi-dimensional, multi-functional. And that's where you end up, you know, if you're, you've got the proximity to downtown, it's very easy for them to also then be, uh, you know, utilitarian functional corridors for people, you know, getting to meaningful destinations like work, school, and to the grocery store. Yeah, absolutely. And we kind of joke about it in the park, you know, we have rush hour too, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like 7.30 to 8 o'clock. You know, you'll see those folks bicycling to work, you know, with their saddlebags on or their panniers, you know, and they've got their change of clothes and then you see them coming home in the night. And yeah, um, yeah. it is it is wonderful <laughs> uh, to be able to provide that alternative transportation route to folks in, in our city. Yeah. So in this image here, uh, you had mentioned earlier about the crossings. Uh, I, I see a couple of, uh, of different crossings uh, represented here. Walk us through what we're looking at. So right now we're looking north along the Arkansas River. Um, it is one of those rare times that it has full water in the river. It is an intermittent prairie stream. So that means that most of the year it's dry. And then uh, when we have lots of rain, it gets nice and pretty like that. So um, in the foreground of this image, you see actually a low water dam. And what is in is uh, the old railroad bridge is what it's called. And it is in the process of actually being replaced right now. So um, it has been removed, but we are putting in a brand new pedestrian bridge right there. Um, this was an old rails to trails project as well. And it used to be um, like a fishing pier, and it was it was a hundred year old railroad crossing uh, that um, the railroad actually went on top of it. And but we put the trail underneath, um, and it worked really great for a number of years. But you know, Tulsa has a few earthquakes; things are starting to shift, um, and the long term viability of this as a bridge was starting to wane. So um, we made the decision through uh, one of our bond packages to replace that bridge with the brand new Williams Crossing, it will be called. And it is a beautiful pedestrian uh, only bridge, uh, well, bicycles as well, but um, that connects both sides of the river. And if you look up at the, um, you know, uh, up in the far ground, you see another bridge, that's our 23rd Street Bridge, which also has a protected um, pedestrian bicycle crossing on that. And then further up further, there's another one. So it's very similar, you familiar with Austin, you know, it's very similar to the Mopac and, and Ladybird Lake where you have several bridge crossings and then 
pedestrian process, crossings associated with it so that you know people who are who are recreating or who are commuting have several options of places they can cross so right now we have one two three four we have five separate crossings to get across the arkansas river so you can add a variety of miles you can make a variety of loops to create all sorts of distances uh, for recreation and training or just, you know, for commuting, there's lots and lots of connectivity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're absolutely right. It's so in- incredibly important. And in, in the case of Austin, you know, our, our weakest link is, is further, uh, to the East. And so there's a new bridge that is being built, uh, right near the Longhorn Dam, because that's one area where, uh, it's, it's less than attractive, <laughs> safe and inviting. It's kind of a, a, a spot where you're, you're really kind of, um, exposed to a lot of car traffic. And so there will be a, bike and pedestrian only bridge uh, immediately uh, before you get to the Longhorn Dam. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so, yeah, and, and this is another uh, impressive view of, of what we're looking at. And now we see a little bit less water in the river than the previous photo. And uh, but it also gives you a really good uh, idea as to you know, some of the infrastructure that's in place here in the park. Yeah. So we're about four miles right now from downtown Tulsa. You can see it off in the distance there. Uh, cleverly, this place is named 41st and Riverside Street Park. So um, you can see our uh, dedicated pel- paved trail in the middle. And this is a place where the trail kind of narrows because it goes through a playground feature that's kind of the center of it, uh, a small parking area, um, restroom facilities. We try to keep our restrooms every three to four miles apart. Um, water station, we have uh, water fountains throughout the whole park. Um, so this is just where the trail narrows in a lot of places. It's a divided trails, but here it's kind of shared. Yeah. Yeah. And when we, uh, when we look, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the restroom facilities. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges too, when planning out, uh, these types of facilities is to think about those sort of comfort facilities, having restrooms available, having uh, water available, having shade and places for people to to rest, uh, especially when we're talking about an all ages and abilities facility, you know, having, you know, a place for, for someone to, a family to stop for a picnic or an elderly person to, to rest for a little while uh, or even a commuter on, on their way home, deciding it's a beautiful day and let's let's stop a little bit. Talk a little bit about the philosophy of of the River Authority and the park land itself in terms of providing those types of comfort amenities throughout. So when the park was first created back in the 1970s, it was basically, if you're looking at the map here, it went from around downtown Tulsa to 21st Street, and that was it. So you had about two miles and then they connected it to the pedestrian bridge, which um, is the pedestrian crossing on the map there. And um, that was it. And so it took a number of years for us to slowly start expanding the trail system down the corridor because uh, a variety of reasons for that. Um, we had a lot of, well, the, the main one reason is funding. So um, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma is a real big fan of creating these quasi autonomous government agencies called authorities. And basically it's Oklahoma saying we want to be able to provide services, but we don't want the taxpayers to have to pay for them. Mm-hmm. So okay. they, they create these authorities. Um, in Oklahoma, we have things like the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority, our Grand River Dam Authority, which is a power authority, um, the Emergency Medical Services Authority, which are these basically they're they're government um, led institutions, but they're charged with providing their own funding and they do that through usage fees. Now, we're a park, so we can't really do usage fees. You know, we're a free amenity. So a vast majority of our um, you know development, we've probably developed around four hundred and twenty million dollars worth of park space, uh, adding amenities, things like that in our 40 year history, almost 50 now. And half of that has been privately fundraised. So, you know, we do get about 50% of our funding through taxes. Um, And I just, I put that all back uh, so that when we talk about the private funding, what's been amazing about that private funding is it's allowed us to 
you know, kind of build better amenities than we would have been able to do with taxpayer funding solely in, you know, solely out of Tulsa-based sales taxes. Um, so we've really been able to add a lot of infrastructure to our park. And starting about 2000, um, we, we really started focusing on the enjoyment of the space. So in 1970s um, and then the early 80s, we added the early 80s, we added like a little restaurant area and a couple of restrooms and then the pedestrian crossing. So, you know, and then, and then we added a fountain area that was a nice attractant. Um, and then it was mostly just for like casual walks along the river. But as, you know, outdoor recreation grew throughout the 1980s, running culture became a very big thing. Um, you know, more and more people started coming for races and stuff. So we started expanding south. And we kind of always had the philosophy that, you know, we were mostly runner based. So runners obviously need more amenities than like say a bicycle. So we ended up being putting, you know, restrooms and things like at least a water fountain every single mile uh, along our entire trail and at least a restroom every two or three miles along the entire corridor of the trail. And luckily, you know, we, we developed as the city developed. So in the 1970s, when the park first started, Riverside Drive, which is that drive right next to us, ended at like 41st Street. Like, you could, like that was just where town ended. So as towns expanded, we've expanded uh, with it. And we've been very fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, and then we, you know, in the early 2000s, we got some very big grants to be able to do the dual trail system. So previously, it was mostly just like kind of a wide sidewalk. Um, and then we were able to re reinvent the whole trail system with the dual trail system and every quarter of a mile at least there are uh, there's a sitting area or a water fountain or a restroom or something along those lines so that um, you know a nice shaded sitting area trash can and then we also installed lighting in the entire park system as well so our park from 11th street all the way down to uh, 96th street and then on the east bank is fully lit at night up until around 11:30 when we shut the lights off because it's curfew. But we have that uh, amenity as well because you know it gets real hot in here in the summer. So a lot of users come out after dark when it's cooler. A lot of them go in the morning when it's cool. So having that lighting is great for safety and security. And so we've just been in a very fortunate uh, position with the grant funding to be able to to be forward thinking like that and to kind of anticipate these things we've been lucky a lot too <laughs> yeah 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 um it, it, it kind of reminds me too that you know there's no one way to go about this you know because uh, oftentimes when you hear about oh you know yeah it's it's a river park and you know it's oh it's it's part of the the city and you just imagine oh this is parks and rec you know, program, but, yeah. oh no, this is not a parks and rec. <laughs> you, no. you, you guys are, uh, are, are clearly having to, um, do a fair amount of, of fundraising, I guess. And obviously mm -hmm. you, you opened us up by talking about the fact that you were a volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say too, that, you know, like our parks department manages 140 something parks, like the city of Tulsa parks department, I um, manage 140 parks, you know, they have a staff of 200 plus, you know, individuals, uh, the river park staff, we manage around a thousand acres of land. Plus I want to say, you know, 30 miles of paved trail. We have 12 people on wow. staff for, <laughs> yeah. for our entire, for our entire system. So, yeah. um, we are, because we're like a quasi autonomous government agency, we don't have to deal with as much red tape. Um, but, you know, and because we deal with a lot of private dollars that are funding these developments, we're really able to uh, capitalize on that and just go straight to building instead of, you know, or straight to repairs versus a lot of the going through the lowest bidder and, and doing all those things, which kind of, you know, red, clog up with red tape uh, the process. So I love that. I mean, that's, you know, at some point in time, you really need to have that ability to like, this is the right thing to do. We've got the funding to do it. Let's just get this done. Uh, this is an interesting perspective. Is is this photoshopped or is this the relationship of the trail in the downtown area? 
Yeah. So you're looking um, right now, you're actually on the western bank of the Arkansas okay. River and as one of our parks called the River West Festival Park. River West Festival Park is about a 14 acre open green space um, wow. that is literally has that view of downtown. And um, and yeah. that's where we're able to put a lot of our large events because yeah. that's one of our main fundraising revenues is putting yeah. on large events. Um, for instance, we actually here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, put on uh, one of the largest Oktoberfest celebrations in oh, the really? nation. Yeah, huh. in the nation. So it's usually um, it's a five day event that's in this, uh, usually around 100,000 people attend attend um it takes over the whole space we build tents the size of football fields uh we sell thousands of uh kegs of beer and it's a major fundraiser for us hmm. fantastic yeah that's great and that is the oktoberfest is actually in october or is there, or is it towards the end of september ours is in october it's usually in, the third october. weekend in october corresponding yeah. with the um uh usually a fall break with kids because you know we have carnivals and all sorts of family friendly uh, games and uh, events and things like that. We have a wiener dog race at yeah. that event, which is really popular. You know, the, the typical stuff you have at October. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, like this, it's one of the cities, it's constantly rated the city's favorite festival. Um, you know, everybody, uh, pretty much everybody in Tulsa, Oklahoma, fun fact, owns Lederhosen. Okay. And and they wear yeah, it. It's there. great. <laughs> I mean, we're all. Yeah, we're is there all, is yeah, there a strong German influence in the city? Yeah, we have a, a large German American society. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Active, and um, that's kind of where a lot of that stuff came from. But yeah, this view is uh, yeah, you're in our park system, and um, you know, actually, we have one of our favorite events um, between Labor Day and well, between Memorial Day and Labor Day is called the Wednesday Night Ride, and that's like you know a, a critical mass kind of ride where this park has about 400 parking spaces filled up with um, bicyclists who all meet at this park and then they launch different rides out there. They all get into groups, but they all go out on Wednesday night and ride. But I mean, it's, it's really cool to be the space that everybody comes to to ride. And then a lot of riders, they just live across the neighborhood, you know, live across the road, they'll ride over, meet up with everybody, go for a 20, 30 mile ride, come back, have a hangout, you know, do all that stuff like that. And it's, it's really great and it's been going on. That Wednesday night ride has been going on for like 15 or 20 years. Um, if not wow. longer. Jeez, I'm going to have to uh, get up that way uh, for uh, for Oktoberfest and do a Wednesday night ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, what's what's absolutely um, essential, you know, for our cities is to be able to provide places that, you know, where you can get a little bit of nature, you can get some great, uh, you know, sunsets like this. And you just, you know, it's so incredibly important. It's refreshing to the soul to be able to do that. You mentioned the the runners and the fact that you recently had had some uh, running events uh, along the line here. Um, runners also tend to like um, unpaved surfaces. Are there any unpaved surfaces where the runners can, can run along? natural yeah, surfaces we, yeah well um there's two main spaces but we did along several stretches of our paved trail do a like a side chat lane you know it's about a foot wide long and i don't know if we have any images of it here um but it's about a foot long wide gravel and that's really good it's not contiguous um most of our runners if they want to hit gravel trails goes to our 600 acre turkey mountain urban wilderness which we're going to yeah. talk about we're going to talk about that a little bit, bit. yeah uh, that's yeah. where a lot of our runners end up going that want to hit the gravel just trails. So yeah, yeah, and of course, you know, this image is is really exemplifying the fact that yes, the majority of of it is in fact paved, and you had made the point that you took that extra step of uh, when you were able to raise the money to be able to separate the, the a pedestrian realm from the, the, the biking realm so that it wasn't just uh, a shared use path. Not that there's anything wrong with shared use paths, but at a certain level, once you get to a certain number of people and participants, the shared use paths, you know, start becoming problematic. And so if you have the ability to separate them all the better. Yeah, it's, it's been very, uh, our, our bark users really appreciate that because, you know, I've been down there in Austin, you know, a lot around Lady Bird Lake <laughs> on the gravel trails, which I love, yeah. but yeah. you know, like Saturday morning at nine o'clock, it's pretty packed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's, 
Yeah. I, I know better too. It's like when I know it's a beautiful day and I'm um, riding my bike from my neighborhood to the grocery store, um, I, I have the option. I can be on a, a quiet street where I'm sharing space with cars or I can go out onto the trail the Butler Hike and Bike Trail, which is a natural surface trail and share space with all the other people walking their dogs and running and, and people biking. And I know that if it's a busy day, I, if it's a beautiful day and I, ah, it's, it's going to be crowded, then I'll take the, the, the quieter uh, street where I share space with cars instead of on the trail, just because it's, you know, it's only 20, 24 feet wide and there's yeah. so many hundreds of people that I would be passing. So, and I love this photo too, because it really, this is exemplifying the fact that you are on going through this linear park land. And so there's lots of opportunity for recreation, lots of opportunity for hanging a hammock and, and, and relaxing and having fun with friends. Yeah. This was a really cool idea that actually one of our park users brought to us. And um, they had seen this kind of Stonehenge type feature. It's just, you know, a uh, spoke wheel of uh, telephone poles in the ground that, you know, you designate as a hammock hang up area. And, you know, people love it. And we're, we're actually thinking about building more of these um, just because it's right next to the trail. People can walk, you know, a few hundred yards from a parking space, get to it. It's, you know, it's nice shade. It's, un it's fully shaded there. Um, we see people all the time just hanging out in their hammocks because we found that hammock users, <laughs> Uh, they'll oftentimes like, they'll see like a sapling and they'll be like, mm, that'll hold me, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, no, and no, so, no. <laughs> no, you know, we're like, Oh, please don't, you know, yeah. that we just, we just put that tree in. So if you can yeah. hang that. Yeah. yeah. And then we do have a, a, one area that is a splash pad. This is again, that 41st street area that we looked at before, which is a nice splash pad area that was again, fully privately funded through our partners at quick trip, um, gas stations. And so, uh, they paid for a lot of these things. So this is uh, a 100% privately donated amenity that we have. Fantastic. And down in that area, you know, the, the, the southern area, the 41st Street and on, uh, who's, you know, from the neighborhood there, who's really coming in to, to the, you know, uh, to that area uh, in terms of like the, the you know, the, the neighborhoods and the, the communities in that area? Yeah, so Tulsa kind of linearly is, there's downtown Tulsa along the River Parks Corridor. There's an area called Maple Ridge, um, which is what the old historic homes, you know, that were all the old rich gas men, you know, and, and that is directly connected to the River Park system. And then as you go further south, you get into an area called Brookside, which is um, a, nice, a, a nice area, you know, it's near the Gathering Place, which is our huge world-class free park. Um, and then, so as you go further south, uh, you get into the river, what do they call it? The river side area. And then you get into the next t town, uh, you get into Jinx, uh, which is a whole another town. It's at the very south end of the park or south end of the park connects to Jinx. And then, you know, we're planning and we'll talk about this in, the, in a little bit, uh, we're, you know, we're planning on extending the trail system, hopefully in the future, all the way, even further south. Um, along the river to uh, Bixby. We already go out to Broken Arrow. So we do connect just a lot of um, neighborhoods through Tulsa. I mean, several of the, you know, I mean, half a dozen different neighborhoods that literally have, um, you know, direct connectivity. So. Yeah, yeah. We'll come back to, to, to the this multimodal safety project here in just a second. Um, uh, the reason why I asked about the, the neighborhoods, too, is that, you know, oftentimes we, we experience this here in, in Austin, and I know many other cities have this as well, is that, yeah, you have sort of the 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 wealthier enclaves and the downtown access and all of that. And then oftentimes there's like this whole uh, desert of amenities and and parkland and, uh, you know, stuff for for underserved communities. And I was just wondering if that was kind of a little bit of the story of the, the further South you got along there and whether this parkland, whether this river authority uh, system, park system started to serve as meaningful amenities to any underserved neighborhoods. Absolutely. Um, Tulsa has its fair share of, uh, um, you know, economically depressed neighborhoods. Um, 
the one photo that we looked at of the beautiful skyline with the woman walking her dog, um, that photo is actually directly behind that is a huge um, HUD housing development. Um, and it's called the Eugene Field Neighborhood. And it is um, uh, one of our, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, supported housing there. There's a lot of free services. And then at 61st Street, all the way to roughly 71st Street is another economically depressed area um, where, you know, you do have a lot of people who don't have their own vehicles who are coming over, accessing the trails. You see them, uh, you'll see a lot of people utilizing the trail system to commute to work uh, there. It's also, we also have a very good bus system that kind of runs up and down Riverside Drive as well to connect all those. So in Tulsa, at least, it goes through the gamut. It goes from the, you know, the, the poor neighborhoods all the way to probably our wealthiest neighborhoods, um, connecting all of those spaces to various different locations. And so it's wonderful to be able to have that, uh, be able to provide that service to a variety of different economic accessibilities. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we're, we're back here at the map and we're going to uh, pop on over here and take a look at, uh, uh, this, uh, this raise award amount, uh, that, that came in, uh, what's going on here. So this is our, our newest exciting news. So our paved trail system on the East bank, you know, uh, of the Arkansas river goes from 11th street all the way down to 96th street on the West bank. It goes from 11th street down to 71st street. So we have about a four mile gap um, that goes from the Turkey Mountain Urban Wilderness at 71st Street down to the city of Jinx in 96th Street. And so we have an organization here in Northeast Oklahoma called the Intercouncil Government, Intercouncil National, uh, INCOG, I can't remember. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, and they, um, actually, if you want to go back, we're oh, okay. some yeah, of that. Uh, yeah. Um, and they just were recently awarded a $16 million grant to build River Parks, a connectivity, connected trail system on the western bank to the city of Jinx. And the main focus of that was actually providing alternative transportation to Jinx and to the southeast suburbs, uh, southwest suburbs, so that, you know, when they, they don't need to commute to downtown anymore. And we're actually building a couple of uh, um, ride share locations that have like a, uh, charging stations for electric vehicles. They'll have, uh, you know, comfort facilities and then they'll have direct connectivity to the trail. So people who are in South Tulsa can, you know, if they need to, they can drive, they can park, they can charge their EV vehicle, while they bicycle to work or while they, you know, recreate. And so we're very excited about that coming through. And that was a huge Department of Transportation grant that we were recently awarded and so that'll be uh, more that's an example of how you know we kind of as river parks function you know we go after these large grants where it's not on the burden of our local taxpayers you know we go after department of transportation grant private dollars to try and build these amenities and, and we were very fortunate enough to have received that so fantastic that's great and then when we take a look here at Turkey Mountain, this is a, an opportunity, I think, to, to really <laughs> create a, a fantastic recreation opportunity. Is that correct? It is. So Turkey Mountain Urban Wilderness was um, one of the original parks uh, for the River Parks Foundation. We got it in about 1978. We got about 100 acres of green space in 1978. We just we didn't think of anything we didn't think of any better terms, so we called it an urban wilderness, whatever that means. You know, uh, you and Austin, you guys have got tons of little pocket parks where you're just like, you know what, leave a green space, let people have some trails back there, whatever they want. But in Tulsa, you know, it was a little bit different. And so Turkey Mountain over the years, as the city has developed around it, has remained this isolated island of green space. And it is a true, you know, green space as far as there are no paved roads, you know, that go through it. There are no uh, facilities. There are no, I mean, it is just woods, right? And it's 600 acres of that. And here recently in the last few years through some bond initiatives, we were able to acquire all of that land as parkland. Um, and so when we did acquire all of the 600 acres as parkland, we started with development of a master plan for how we wanted to manage that green space. And so here is an image of kind of 
the Turkey Mountain Urban Wilderness as it exists today. Um, at the top image, you're looking at the green spaces, the wilderness. You can see this, the, how the city surrounds it. Uh, yeah, you can see all of the development around it and its relationship to the river corridor. Uh, that white dot in the middle is a big water tower because it's a hill. It's a big, but it rises about 250 feet above the river corridor. Um, and it's got a few power line right of ways, but for the most part, it's just green space. Uh, this is the 71st Street Bridge in the foreground, and then uh, Highway 44, roughly 51st Street, uh, in the middle of the screen. And you can see downtown Tulsa off in the distance. So it's very unique, not unique, but it's, it's very uncommon to find 600 acres of contiguous green space, literally five miles from a major urban center. And so Tulsa is very fortunate enough to have this green space. And so when we went through our master plan development of like how we wanted to continue to maintain this as a wild space, as a green space, as a recreation space, uh, you, you'll scroll to the bottom. Um, we envisioned a space that had a lot more connectivity, uh, an improved soft surface trail system, um, connectivity to other parks that are nearby, uh, new access points with potential bridges um, and better systems of uh, connecting to our paved trails. So um, that's kind of what that image is kind of overlaying is a lot more uh, pedestrian friendly things. And, you know, one of the things that they realized too, you know, mountain biking has been growing in popularity uh, here in the last decade or so. And our proximity to Bentonville, Arkansas, which yep, is kind of just going to say that <laughs> the current Mecca of uh, mountain biking. Uh, uh, we're literally two hours from it. And so, um, you know, we, we uh, you know, made a conscious decision to add more mountain bike uh, kind of amenities and features to our trail system where it was, you know, a, like our, the current state of the trail system at Turkey Mountain was so it was never properly built it was just social trails that went wherever they wanted to so they were incredibly eroded they had zero accessibility like you know if you had any mobility issues at all you weren't going on the trails at turkey mountain period like you couldn't access them and so and, and we, to be clear for for those who are listening to this and who are, are watching this is that when we talk about accessibility for mountain bike trails and bike parks like this, we literally are talking about, you know, people with disabilities being able to use adaptive cycles. And so it, it is important to, to when you're developing these sorts of recreational trails and facilities, uh, in, even when they're single track, even when there are mountain biking uh, trails like this, you're, you're keeping that in mind uh, so that, you know, it really truly becomes an activity asset for all ages and abilities. Yeah, and we have uh, several parks, Bales Parks that you can see in the, the hinterland, Wooster Creek, uh, also in the hinterland area, that have been rated as uh, adaptive uh, cycling uh, capable. Um, so, you know, they're, they're very cool. And we're in the process of building those trails at Turkey Mountain. We don't, don't have the ratings yet, but we will have those for our adaptive cyclists. But what we're doing is we're doing a combination of, you know, mixed-use trails, so shared-use, multi-use trails, for our hikers and our bikers and our runners. And then we are building several downhill mountain bike only, you know, fun, woo, jumpy jumps uh, yeah, yeah. for the mountain bikes. And so we've actually, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but we've actually just completed uh, two of the largest downhill mountain bike only trails in the state of Oklahoma at Turkey mm. Mountain. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's so incredibly important and special to be able to have access, easy access, you know, to a community, you know, to a neighborhood, to a downtown area, to be able to jump on your bike and be able to ride directly to, uh, you know, a park, be able to ride directly to a recreational facility such as this. Yeah. And, you know, Turkey Mountain is almost in the heart of the city. There's probably within a six, seven mile radius, I want to say there's in the neighborhood of probably 200,000 people that could bicycle or walk to Turkey Mountain that have that, you know, connectivity. And Turkey Mountain's it, it connected to our River Parks trail system. There are several bike lanes, you know, bike routes that come through the city that you can hop on and you can literally like ride to Turkey Mountain from your house. You can ride 
30 plus miles of soft surface trail or run a marathon without hitting the same tw trail twice uh, at our urban wilderness. And so that is just an incredible resource to be able to have for people. And our goal is from our park management is to absolutely maintain it in this wild and natural state. You know, we're, we're very doing, you know, we're trying to, we're, reno we're we are renovating our trail system. So we are ma machine building new, more sustainable trails that aren't basically caverns of erosion <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that stay muddy for weeks on end um, and making them more accessible and making them spaces where, you know, you can come to more frequently because uh, they'll dry out quicker and um, and just have that for everybody here in Tulsa. And it was really interesting. You know, one of the things that happened when we first started building the trails out here was, you know, uh, the community had a, some of the community were kind of opposed to it because they didn't want to see change. They thought we were going to come in with bulldozers and, you know, put giant pads in stuff like that. And, and when you are building a trail, it certainly looks like that. <laughs> right, uh, right. But, you know, after a year or two of growth cycle, it, it narrows back down to a more single track kind of trail or, or just a narrower trail. And our goal is to look like we have never done anything at all. That's right. the whole purpose of building these new trails is just that when, whenever we leave, you, you won't know that we've been there. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I ling I'm lingering on this image here because it, uh, it hearkens to uh, one of the activities that I do for, for my own health and well-being these days. And that's trail running is getting out on soft surfaces and, 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 and being able to, to do that. And um, it, it seems like that this area would also be conducive to the trail running community, too. Oh, it is a huge center of trail running. It is the center of trail running in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And because we have, you know, most of our trails are shared use. Uh, there is, you know, like I mentioned, there's probably 30 miles plus of shared use trail and then around five miles of dedicated mountain bike only trail. So, you know, and our shared trails are, uh, and then we are going to be designating around five miles as pedestrian only. Kind of fair, right? You have five miles of biking trail. We're going to have five miles of pedestrian only. Just again to kind of diversify or uh, spread people out because 600 acres sounds like a lot until you put like 5,000 people in it and then it's like it's kind of crowded around here <laughs> but uh, you know so we are um, trying right now uh, yeah so it, trail running is great out here I mean we probably we have six or seven large uh, you know 5k's uh, 10k's marathons that happen at Turkey Mountain uh, on a yearly basis um, all of the running clubs, they meet there on a frequent basis and, and go, you know, running, use that as a waypoint. Um, there's, you know, regular Tuesday night groups, there's Wednesday night groups, uh, all sorts of people that come to Turkey Mountain uh, for the pedestrian side of things. And, and so I think that, you know, it, all of our trail running community loves it. It also has elevation, you know, like it has several steep hills. So if you're training for like, you know, a run somewhere else, you can really get in those elevation miles as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we do, you, you notice that there's just the richness of, of what it's like, you know, getting into nature and being able to experience some of those wilderness areas. And you're absolutely right. Once, once you give it a little bit of time, those, uh, improved and enhanced trails, they grow back. <laughs> and so, you know, you're, you're able to do it, but you have, a uh, as you mentioned, you have a more stable, um, natural surface trail in place so that the erosion uh, issue isn't isn't as pronounced. So, yeah, and, and obviously a good place for some of the scouts too. And getting a hike in. Um, and 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 this is something that that I think is really really important too to 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 realize is that when when I say all ages and abilities activity asset, in the one of the reasons why. It's important to invest in, you know, these types of trail systems, these tri types of recreational facilities. It really is, you know, giving kids an opportunity to be able to experience that joy of being able to, to ride a mountain bike in true mountain biking conditions and, and how much fun that really is. Yeah. One of our biggest partners who I will praise to the heavens continuously is a group called Bike Club. And they're here in Tulsa and they have an organization in Oklahoma City. But they are, you know, mountain bike and bicycle advocates. 
and they do an after school program in 30 plus schools here in Tulsa. They have hundreds of volunteers that go out on a regular basis, like, you know, weekly or monthly to schools and lead kids on group rides. They teach them bicycle safety. They give them, you know, lessons on it. They ride in groups together, you know, in all sorts of conditions on our paved trails, you know, in uh, on road trails and then at our soft surface trails uh, on a regular basis. And they are huge promoters of kids on bicycles in Tulsa. And so thousands of kids have been recipients of their um, amazing work. And, you know, one of the reasons that's actually we're kind of scared because like they're putting so many kids on bikes that like in the future, they're all going to be coming to Turkey Mountain. And so we're trying to, as an organization, build even more soft surface trails, prepping for them, you know, when they start hitting those teenage years and, you know, further on to be coming to our green spaces. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and again, it's, and, and it's not just for the boys, by the way, guys, you know, <laughs> get, those, yeah, get those girls out there on the bikes. They absolutely uh, love it as well. Um, it, when we are looking at this type of thing, and, and is this going to be, is this the, the Turkey Mountain area or is this something else? Yeah, this is, this is Turkey Mountain area. This is just a Strava heat map, um, just to kind of show you, uh, you know, Strava heat maps are always fun to look at. The two bright lines, that dark line in the middle is the Arkansas River, and then the really hot lines along the center, that's our paved trail system. Sure, right? sure. If you look at how hot that is compared to the Turkey Mountain, there are several trails at Turkey Mountain which are heavily, heavily used, you know, almost as much as our paved trail system. Now, on this Strava heat map, this is actually our old trail system, and so those are trails that are all pretty badly eroded, they have very minimal accessibility, uh, and they're not going away. We're actually just kind of building new accessible trails in different areas. So, cause a lot of our users, they're like, I like the Rocky trails, you know, I yeah, want, yeah, yeah. I want to break my ankle, uh, when I'm running <laughs> or, or riding. And so we left those in place and just started right. overlaying a new system of trails that have proved to be a uh, very wildly popular. Yeah. Yeah. And there we can yeah. see the existing and proposed. Yeah, and space. so we're just looking at some of the yeah some of the uh, spaces, and we're talking about access. And so what we're going to try to do too is, you know, all of those aren't necessarily parking areas; they're more just like access points. Um, but right now we have two access, two parking lots, and so we're trying to expand the areas of access so that you know right now you know you have 600 acres, you have two parking lots. You know, within a half mile of each of those parking lots, it is log jammed with people. You get outside of that half mile radius. You don't see another person for the whole day, even on like on a busy Saturday. So we're trying to spread people out through this green space by giving them more access points so that like when you come, it doesn't necessarily feel super congested throughout your entire time there. And pro tip, folks, it's an easy ride to get there. Don't it even really drive, is. just ride yeah, there. You, <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, like a lot of people do and more and more people every day are doing that because on a Saturday, we currently have 300 available parking spots at Turkey Mountain. And on a nice Saturday, you know, you're waiting 10, 15 minutes for a free spot to open up. So we highly encourage people to bicycle or walk over from the neighborhoods. I mean, it is easy to get to. People think, I don't want to walk uh, one mile. I'm going to go for a five mile, 10 mile hike at Turkey Mountain. You know, like what's one more mile? Yeah, one exactly. Mile. And I think that's interesting too, because when we look at this particular image here, we're, we're looking at bridging across an expanded site and we're looking at this, uh, this, uh, this Bales Bridge uh, connectivity. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're talking about here? Is, is some you yeah. know, so expanded uh, access? Yeah, so expanded access that Bales Park. Um, there's right underneath that. That is a, a major highway called Highway 75. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of it splits Turkey Mountain from another 200 acres of park mm -hmm. that are three that are three separate parks, but we yeah. call them the hinterlands. But it's Bales Park, Lubell Park, and Mooser Creek Greenway. But they're all connected. They're all connected, and um, we're trying to connect better. Turkey Mountain to those green spaces so that we can make Turkey Mountain an 800 acre kind of connected space versus a 600 area connected space. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you can see the development, you know, around there and the neighborhoods and the communities that feed, you know, can be, you know, fed by this. And so all the more reason to be able to have that connectivity, to be able to have the ability for somebody to, you know, be able to ride their bike and be able to hit all of these areas and, and not yeah. have to feel compelled to have to drive. Yeah. So, and yeah. as we were talking about, you know, the areas of like, uh, Tulsa that might not have, you know, the, the, the rich neighborhoods, the poor neighborhoods, um, the area there around Bells Park is a qualified census tract uh, neighborhood. So again, it's a uh, HUD housing and they'll, when we are able to improve that connectivity, a lot of uh, those folks, you know, will be able to get to the green space a lot easier because um, right now you have to kind of cross like a narrow old bridge that's pretty scary. It doesn't have any yeah. sidewalks on it or anything. We're, we're going to, uh, the city's replacing that bridge here in the near future um, with eight foot wide sidewalks, bike lanes that'll be able to connect. So then connect to the Bales Park and, and the further hinterland. So we're trying to get all these things connected uh, uh, to just, you know, make it even more wonderful space. Yeah. Yeah. Good so, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is part of, this is just a quick shot looking at um, a few ideas that we're doing, but Turkey Mountain as a green space is actually um, a very, unfortunately, it looks really pretty, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our Oklahoma Forestry Services and our ecologists tell us it's a pretty unhealthy forest because yeah. it's, it's you know, choked with invasive species. Right, And right. so we've been um, working on, uh, uh, for the last year, we've been working on trying to restore the habitat as well out there more to its natural state so what did it look like about a hundred years ago is what we're shooting for before you know manifest destiny and and build fences and graze cattle so we're trying to revert that you know 100 percent canopy back to some open prairie savanna some open mixed uh forest they call it the cross timbers region and so this is kind of like a savanna where you have like a clump of trees a grassy area, a clump of trees. So we're trying to restore a lot of the areas of Turkey Mountain back to that. Um, we have introduced prescribed burning. We just did a prescribed burn about two months ago uh, on a small 15 acre plot project, but we still got it done, uh, which we were very excited around. Cause it's like, we're in the middle of the city and we're lighting a mountain on fire. Um, you know, a very small portion, but we're also working with uh, the Oklahoma Forestry Services. They've been partnering with us to help knock back a bunch of invasive species through mechanical removal um, and things like that. And then the prescribed fire. And so far, you know, between mechanical removal and um, prescribed fire, we've been able to treat around 150 acres of the 600 acre green space for invasive species. Now we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us, but sure, sure. it is part of an overall arching plan for this green space. Yeah. And I love that integration of you're working on creating, uh, you know, a recreation area, people oriented space in there. But you're also trying to, you know, rectify some of those uh, things that kind of went awry with an invasive species really kind of choking off and, and kind of changing, like you said, you know, what used to be there 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So. Yeah, that's that's yeah. I think a really important uh, aspect of it, um, and and more, you know, of the the different loops and all the downhill courses and all that good stuff. When do you anticipate uh, being completely done? So right now we have funding through twenty twenty five. So okay. um, that will be when we'll be done, and so our goal is to build around 25 miles of multi-use bi-directional shared trail right. and then also build around five to seven miles of downhill mountain bike single direction flow trail yeah. uh, for those folks and so and then these images, uh, what you were just describing in terms of, you know, the, that process of trying to get those invasive uh, plants out of there, we, we kind of see, you know, what, what it looks like in year one. You've got your prescribed burn here and then you go through year five and you're still kind of working on that. And you're, you're, start, you're starting to really deal with that understory, you know, kind of stuff and, and trying yeah. to create a healthier, uh, you know, savannah like uh experience and savannah and prairie 
Mm-hmm. And so hopefully keeping our fingers crossed if everything goes as planned in 10 years, you're going to be, you know, looking like a much more, uh, restored Savannah prairie environment, ecology, and you can see that your, your native oaks are going to be much happier too, because they're not going to be as choked. Yeah. One of the things we found out through this process, uh, you know, when we were dealing with the master plan was, you know, Oklahoma forestry service came out, we had a dendrochronologist came out, date the trees, we have several trees that date all the way back to 1775, so the birth of the United States. But they were telling us we're ha- we have so many invasive species right now at Turkey Mountain that are, are native oaks. Um, there's actually not many of them being reborn. And so what's going to happen over time is as those oaks die off, they're going to be replaced by privet, Chinese privet, you know, and winged elm and things like that, which are all of these like short, scrubby, ugly looking brush trees. And we won't have any more oaks anymore. So, you know, in 100 years from now, we could potentially have like a mountain that's just full of shrubs, basically, and no shade. All the oaks are gone. You know, it's, it's it, 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 even though it's a, a full canopy right now, we're, we need to get that age gap uh, fixed. So this is where the prescribed fire, the clearing out, um, making it possible for oaks to new oaks to be born uh, that'll be alive in 100 years time. So, yeah. What have we not talked about yet that you really think uh, the audience should hear about? Uh, You know, one of the things that I I really want to, I like to stress is that, you know, river parks, we have around 2 million visitors a year. And that's pretty good numbers for people who are commuting and and recreating in the park system. We we like to joke that we're the largest outdoor uh, gym in Tulsa. because of just how much recreation we provide and how we do it with a very small staff. And Turkey Mountain is a space that, you know, is so unique to urban centers. And we see around 250,000 visitors a year at Turkey Mountain. So, you know, quarter million people, not just from Tulsa, but regionally, uh, those mountain bikers that are going to Bentonville, they stop in Tulsa now for a day to explore our space. They spend dollar bills in our hotels and our restaurants. And, and so, economically you know we are mindful of the fact that you know these private dollars are helping actually the public out in more ways than just providing a recreation space we're actually benefiting the economy so yeah yeah and uh, i have up on screen here the uh, the volunteer tab um talk a little bit about uh how you uh are trying to engage with the public and encourage volunteerism. And obviously that was your history. You were a volunteer. Yeah, I was. Yeah. So we have, um, uh, volunteer opportunities at all of our major events, Oktoberfest, 4th of July, all of our fundraising events. We always, you know, it's a fundraising event. So the less we can spend on staffing is the more dollar bills that we can put back into literally. And I'm not joking, literally keeping the lights on, mowing the grass in our green space. And so, yeah. Those funds directly go to those things. Yeah, that's awesome, though. So so plenty of opportunities to, to volunteer, especially for those events. Um, I know in our local um, uh, Shoal Creek Conservancy, uh, sometimes volunteers are helping uh, with some of the invasive species removal. Do you have opportunities for that and, and like uh, trail buildings or trail maintenance as well? We sure do. So we actually just, because Turkey Mountain has become such a popular place, um, we actually started the Turkey Mountain Trail Team, which is a new uh, volunteer opportunity where it's an adopted trail program. And so you sign up for that um, uh, program. We go through some trainings. We actually teach you basic trail maintenance. So how to nick drains, how to repair erosion, how to properly Uh, trim back the trails so that you're not actually doing more harm than good. Um, And then we have massive work days where we do uh, invasive species removal, cutting and treating privet. Um, We do trail building and trail repair days with that. So, you know, we have um, right now we have around 150 volunteers who have signed up for that adopt trail program. So we are very fortunate enough to be able to have that. And, you know, it does, it takes, a ton of people to be able to maintain these trails. Whereas before, you know, it was kind of all, uh, you know, for 40 years, Turkey Mountain was kind of, it was a river parks land, but we didn't have any funding or resources to, like to dedicate to the trails. Right, right. We, yeah. we built parking lots. We, we provided restrooms. We took out the trash. We put lighting. But for the actual soft surface trails, we did nothing. 
And it was all just a ragtag group of like, you know, kids out there with shovels, building jumps or, you know, volunteers repairing things. Um, but finally, you know, we've been able to do a, a huge philanthropic fundraising effort. So in the past year and a half, two years, we've raised around $12 million between our public um, dollars from uh, bonded packages and then around $6 million in private donations that we're able to directly put back into Turkey Mountain and build these trails. And, and so um, having volunteers come out of the woodwork literally uh, has been a wonderful thing because right now there's only one person whose job is Turkey Mountain and that's me. That's it. Yeah. There's no, there's not, there's not a staff of hundreds, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's, it's 30 miles of trail. Um, and so we literally couldn't do this without our volunteers. So there, there it is. There's the call for volunteers, folks. <laughs> if you are in the area, always. always yes. I will absolutely. always take free labor. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Ryan Hal, it has been such an absolute joy and pleasure having you on the active towns podcast. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And I appreciate the ability to shed some light on the Tulsa Oklahoma community and hopefully it'll encourage a few of you to swing on by. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this episode with Ryan Howell with the River Parks Authority in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell as well. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts uh, by becoming a Active Towns Ambassador uh, via Patreon, buy me a coffee, uh, making a contribution to the nonprofit, buying something from the Active Towns store. Uh, hey, it all adds up and is much appreciated. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.